Welcome back to Nuclear Proliferation Explained. I'm William Spaniel. Today's topic is nuclear compellents. We finished up the unit on why countries develop nuclear weapons, and we are now transitioning into what happens once countries have acquired those arsenals. Let's get to it. To begin our analysis of nuclear compellents, I want to throw out the nuclear part for just a minute and focus just on what compellents means. We've seen this simple escalation game before. An aggressor chooses whether to just quit straight away or challenge the status quo. If the aggressor challenges, the defender chooses then to stand firm or back down. With this simple setup, we can begin to define what compellence means. In particular, if an aggressor challenges the status quo and then the defender backs down, we might say that this is an instance of successful compellence. The aggressor wanted something to change, it called out the defender on it, and rather than fight over the issue, the defender backed down and let the aggressor take it. The aggressor has successfully compelled something out of the defender. Similarly, we can define failed compellence by looking at situations where an aggressor challenges the status quo and then the defender stands firm. The aggressor wanted to get something out of the defender, and the defender said, no, I would rather fight over the issue than just give it to you. The aggressor has failed to compel something out of the defender. To be clear, the aggressor might ultimately get what it wants in this sort of situation. But it is not obtaining that by forcing the defender to back down, but rather by defeating the defender on the military battlefield. And in the event of a conflict, it's fully possible as well that the aggressor might lose, in which case, not only is it failing to compel the defender to do what it wants, it's not obtaining what it wants through conflict, and it's suffering the cost of the conflict in the process. A third possibility is that the aggressor just quits straight away, and we don't have any attempt at compellence at all. While this might not seem particularly pertinent to our discussion of compellence, the possibility that an aggressor might strategically choose to quit rather than challenge the status quo is critical for making inferences about what we observe empirically. We'll be seeing this point again in a moment. Now that we understand what compellence is in isolation, we can define what nuclear compellence is. And in particular, it is the causal effect of nuclear weapons allowing an aggressor to challenge the status quo successfully against the defender. What that means is the following. Imagine that we had a hypothetical country that had no nuclear weapons. And in that situation, this country would just choose to quit straight away. Or alternatively, in this world where the aggressor does not have nuclear weapons, it would challenge and the defender would stand firm. In either of these cases, we are not having an instance of successful compellence. Now let's keep everything the same, but endow the aggressor with nuclear weapons. If before, the outcome of the game would have been that the aggressor quits, or that the aggressor challenges and then the defender stands firm. If the new outcome of the game, post-nuclear weapons, is the nuclear aggressor challenging and the defender backing down, then we have nuclear compellence. That is, nuclear weapons cause the defender to back down in a situation where that would not have been the case without nuclear weapons. The argument why nuclear weapons might have that sort of effect is straightforward. Nuclear weapons are the most powerful weapons mankind has ever created. It stands to reason, then, that a defender staring down a nuclear-armed aggressor might want to buckle to the aggressor's demands and avoid the consequences of a nuclear detonation. And indeed, there is some evidence for this. If we look at the domain of crises involving states in the post-proliferation world, and we do our best to control for other factors, nuclear weapon states are more likely to win in crises than non-nuclear weapon states are. Moreover, and perhaps better connecting to the mechanism that I just described, crises involving nuclear weapon states tend to be shorter. 
that's consistent with the idea that a defender staring down a nuclear-armed aggressor might want to end the conflict more quickly so that there is a shorter period of time where something could go wrong and there might be some sort of nuclear attack against it. That being said, there is not a consensus that nuclear weapons are great instruments of coercion. In fact, there are many issues that come up with nuclear weapons that don't exist for other sorts of weapons programs. Take tactical nuclear weapons, like the Stavy Crockett device seen here, as an example. If you try using one of these on the battlefield, and the winds just so happen to shift at the wrong time, suddenly your soldiers are going to be exposed to the radioactive fallout from that weapon. There's a similar problem on a macro scale. India has disputed territories with both China and Pakistan. Imagine any of those three countries were to use nuclear weapons within those disputed territories. Well, the value of those territories will suddenly drop. There's going to be lingering radioactive fallout for years to come, and whatever you were planning on doing with those territories is no longer going to be as good of an idea. The alternative then would seem to not be to use nuclear weapons on the area that you wanted to conquer for yourself, but rather on the homeland of the opposing country, maybe that country's capital or most populous of cities. The problem there is international backlash. There's a norm against using nuclear weapons. And if you break that taboo, say by bombing the opposing capital with a nuclear weapon, you're going to have many other countries rise up against you. They might do so militarily, or they might do so by imposing economic sanctions. Either way, that is going to disincentivize your use of nuclear weapons. And perhaps the biggest issue of all, if you're facing a country that also has nuclear weapons and you use your arsenal, you're liable to receive a nuclear counterattack. In summary, just because you have nuclear weapons doesn't mean they're necessarily useful for compellent purposes. And in particular, if the opponent believes that your threats to use nuclear weapons are not credible, then they're not going to buckle to your demands just because you're challenging the status quo. To illustrate what I mean, let's talk about a situation involving Richard Nixon during the Vietnam War. The war wasn't going well for the United States, and Nixon wanted to compel the Soviet Union to put pressure on North Vietnam to buckle to U.S. demands in peace negotiations. You might recall that in the early parts of the Cold War, the United States ran something known as Operation Chrome Dome. These were 24-7 flights going from the United States to various other parts of the Earth closer to the Soviet Union, so that in the event of the president wanting to initiate a strike against the Soviet Union, the time delay would be reduced. Chrome Dome stopped after a series of accidents capped by the crash of a nuclear-armed plane outside of the Thule facility in Greenland. Nixon's idea was to restart these flights to convince the Soviet Union that he was serious. But the Soviet Union effectively ignored them, and Nixon stopped. Nuclear compellents didn't work here. Corresponding to this, if we look deeper into crises, nuclear weapon states are no more likely to compel their opponents to give up something than countries without nuclear weapons. They may be winning crises generally, but they're not actually compelling concessions out of their opponent. There are two different explanations for what's happening here, and this is why we don't have a consensus for whether nuclear weapons are useful for compellents more broadly. The first explanation is that defenders are essentially acting like the Soviet Union here. They're thinking that nuclear weapons are not useful for these purposes, and so if a nuclear aggressor challenges the status quo, it's not going to cause the defender to do much, because if the defender were to stand firm, nuclear weapons would not influence what would happen next. But there's an intriguing second possibility. Perhaps aggressors think of nuclear weapons as an insurance policy. If nuclear weapons can protect them in the worst case scenario, then they're free to take more risks. What that would mean is that nuclear aggressors are willing to challenge under circumstances where they think that they are more likely to lose. 
As a result, it's possible that the additional compellent benefits that nuclear weapons provide nuclear aggressors are offset by this increased willingness to engage in crises that are unlikely to work otherwise, and thus the effect washes out. That wraps up this lecture. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time. Take care.